Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this space, which is um, uh, Zim Live's inaugural uh, space, um, and also my very first space uh, to, to host on, on this platform. On the 3rd of February, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission handed over to President Emerson Mnangagwa his final delimitation report, at least according to the chairperson um, Priscilla Chigumba. And the uh, report fixed the ward and constituency boundaries for general elections now expected in August. It has perhaps been the most contested delimitation process in history, with the outcome of an independent constitutional body now standing, you know, accused of batting for this or that political side. Now, as you would expect with um, uh, 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 this particular case, you know, politicians are up in arms. Uh, accusations and counter accusations of advantage or unfair play are being traded across the political divide. Uh, interestingly, we see certain very curious convergences as well in uh, positions uh, with respect to the delimitation report by strange bedfellows, you know, across the political divide. And I hope that this discussion will delve a bit more into that. Um, my name is Chofa Mbazitole, and I'm joining you this evening, you know, to uh, facilitate a discussion between um, two eminent uh, intellectuals of our time who need no introduction. Uh, Professor Jonathan Moyo, um, you could say perhaps maybe he's um, a lightning rod for controversy on these streets, um, which I must say never faces him. And uh, uh, Professor Love Momaduku, uh, constitutional law expert. No, I will not refer to his party political hat to, uh, this evening because uh, much of the discussion that we expect uh, from him and the assistance that we would require from him is uh, or, or, or would relate to his constitutional expertise. And um, without further ado, uh, because I see that uh, our two other speakers, the political party representatives, Wazano PF, uh, Mr. Tafadzo Mugwadi, and um, Honorable Prince Dubego Sibanda for CCC, are uh, yet to join us. But I have been assured that um, the two gentlemen will um, uh, join us during the course of this uh, uh, discussion. So without uh, further ado, we should get into our discussion. And um, I was agonizing as to who to um, ask to go first. But uh, I think um, uh, given the order of appearance here, uh, Professor Moyo was uh, on time. And um, for that, he is rewarded with uh, the um, opportunity to go first. So Professor, I would extend this... Um, uh, moment to you to, to, to go first. Thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, Jofamba, uh, and good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Zim Live for this opportunity to participate. Um, but um, I just want to double check. Uh, I'm um, okay and very delighted you've uh, offered me uh, the first opportunity. Uh, but uh, you did so not on merit, <laughs> but simply because I showed up on time. <laughs> and on the panel here is my professor, whom I respect as a professor. And I'm happy to have him start first. Well, if you should insist on extending the honor to your professor, then um, uh, who are we to argue with uh, <laughs> such magnanimity? So, uh, Professor Mauduku, you can take over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I need to greet Professor Moyo. Um, and then, of course, to acknowledge that uh, he still wants the uh, to associate with his uh, professor, I'm sure he's still working on his work, and I'm very pleased to have him. He was a very good, 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 very good student of ours uh, on the law program. It was very unfortunate that uh, he had to leave the country at a time that um, he was at the center of his studies, uh, something that I keep uh, worrying about. Um, I'm sure you should know that, including uh, two other people that didn't finish their law degrees. So, Professor Moyo, thank you. I can uh, uh, go on and then deal with some of the issues that uh, 
perhaps would be useful for the discussion here. Uh, bearing in mind the hat that uh, I've been forced to wear, which is just purely as a as a as, as a constitutional law um, lecturer or expert or professor, so that I will stick to that. Uh, professor, just uh, sorry I, to interrupt you. Um, I think yes, in terms of the, the initial submissions, um, and which would help us to set you know the uh, the context and framework of this discussion, that would help. If uh, in the question uh, 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 segment you feel um, you might wish to throw your own political perspective into the uh, into the fray, then that 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 would be uh, perfectly okay. So you've got the next ten, fifteen minutes to set out you know the key issues, um, and then we can, uh, Professor Moyo can come in, and the two party representatives will also come in. Okay, thank you very much. I think that would be inevitable. Not that I'm anticipating any of those, but I'm sure many of your questioners will also bring in some of these political terms. Okay, I should start um, by saying, and I think Professor Mo will look at the political dimensions of uh, delimitation, but I want to look at the fact that the delimitation process in our country is regulated by the Constitution. So when one looks at the Constitution, they will find that there are specific provisions there. It is not an exercise where you could try and look around and say that this is not clear, uh, that is left to speculation and so forth. Most of the things are clear. And I'm saying so mindful of the fact that there are some people who have said in the course of the contributions to the debate, that uh, we need a delimitation act, in other words, an act of parliament that goes into detail to specify that it also appears that some people in parliament were saying the same thing. That might be useful, but they will have to justify the additional issues that they say are not there. That's my first point. So the constitution does specify this. Then the second point is that we have had delimitation all, ar all along. Um, in a country that is based on uh, constituencies, you will have to have some delimitation process of sorts. So we've always heard that in our um, constitution, the old constitution, Lancaster's constitution, had a delimitation process. The main difference is that uh, under the old constitution, up to about 2008, we had a separate body called the Delimitation Commission which was appointed uh, from time to time whenever a delimitation was uh, deemed necessary, uh, the president would constitute a delimitation commission. It was a very interesting framework. Only four members were provided for in that commission. And many Zimbabweans may recall that uh, the late Justice Sandura was well known for chairing the various delimitation commissions that were set in place. And then with the amendments that came in 2008, which are also now part of the constitution, I think it was amendment 2005, it was then decided that even the delimitation process itself would be undertaken by the electoral commission. So now you have delimitation function added to the electoral commission. So it's the commission that does that. It's also common cause, uh, I got the third fact, to go to the issues uh, that uh, are topical now. The commission is guided by section 160 and 161 of our constitution. And I think listeners can always um, get to read those. One, one thing I need to encourage Zimbabweans um, to just get to read some of these provisions, that they don't just listen to the lawyers or listen to the political analysts, or listen to the uh, media. Journalists sometimes also get involved in spreading some information. But it's important that uh, one looks at Section 160 and Section 161 of the Constitution. There are a number of guidelines there. Of course, one guideline is that it must be done once uh, every 10 years. We must make sure that uh, we have a, a, a delimitation which takes place as soon as possible after a census. That's a provision of the Constitution. Then uh, there's also a provision that says that um, 
if you complete a delimitation less than six months before polling in a general election, then you cannot use the results of that delimitation. In other words, for a delimitation process to work, uh, for an election, it must be completed six, six months or more uh, before that election. Then there are guidelines about how these boundaries will be drawn. But the general principle is the principle of equality of voting. In other words, the equal, equality of voting strength, there must be approximately equal numbers of voters in each constituency or in each ward, then subject to some provision which allows a variation. And I think people now know that there is reference to a 20% variation. These things are in the Constitution. What I want to look at more seriously is this issue of uh, the processes. Let's assume that uh, ZEC has done its delimitation uh, and has some work done. The Constitution insists that uh, you cannot just get out of ZEC and go straight to have a delimitation. Then two other organs of state must be involved. This is what the Constitution puts in, and that is mandatory. The Constitution realizes that there are two other institutions that are critical. The first institution is the President, who in terms of our Constitution is an institution on his or her own, in the sense of the head of the executive, of course, the head of state, but he is the executive authority. Then the other institution is Parliament. Now, the Constitution wants Zek to produce first a preliminary report. Uh, this is the language of the Constitution. Zek might actually feel that uh, it has done its work and it, this is really final. They've done everything that they deem appropriate. Whatever they want or they think, the Constitution requires them to regard their first output as a preliminary report. They must submit that to the President who is then required to uh, place or table that report before Parliament. Now, the Constitution says the President must do it within seven days of receiving from uh, ZEC. It's clear that the seven days referred to in the Constitution, these are seven actual days. Um, in other words, you count weekends, you count um, uh, public holidays as well. The president must do that without delay. Uh, this is clear that the intention of the constitution, I'm sure, is to ensure that the politicians don't play around. So you have a very strict timeline there. You get the president, he tables it before parliament within seven days. I must say immediately that this was not complied with uh, in the sense that the president received the report uh, on 26 December. He was only able to uh, table it in Parliament on the 6th of January, uh, 2023. He received it in 2022. Uh, the clear, clear things, of course, they didn't comply. It doesn't mean that everything that followed was invalid. The, there are certain things where there are breaches of the Constitution that may not necessarily invalidate what has been done. And then there are breaches that invalidate what you have done. So the subsequent um, tabling before Parliament, although irregular in the sense that it was done outside the seven-day period, may be regarded in terms of the Constitution as valid in itself. But I know that uh, the government itself, uh, whether they did it, I think looked like deliberate. They just, from nowhere, the government um, uh, information office started by introducing seven working days. They announced that the President received the report and that he was going to date before Parliament within seven working days. They introduced working days. Uh, that was not a correct thing. So once the President then tables before Parliament, Parliament has 14 days within which it must consider the report um, and then raise any matter or issues that it might want to refer back to Zek. This is what the Constitution says. And again, the 14 days, they are not working days. They are really 14 actual days. And I think everyone now knows that when Parliament received it, they made it clear that they were going to use seven actual days. They were trying to remit what had been 
done previously by the executive. It's something worth noting for the convener that uh, it's a common Zimbabwean disease of not sometimes raising issues and then leaving <laughs> politicians to get away with some of these things. So within that 14-day period, Parliament uh, looks at it. Then the Constitution also says that the President himself or herself may also consider the report and refer matters or issues to ZEC. So the two institutions are allowed to look at that. But the Constitution is very clear that the, the communication line between the Electoral Commission and these political organs is the president. So the president receives tables. <clears throat> when parliament has finished, it must give it back to the president for onward transmission to the to ZEC. There is a debate as to whether parliament can say we reject the report or not. The It appears they can only raise matters or issues, which is what has happened. So I'm not then going to be worrying about that because that did not happen in this case. Parliament raised issues and then these were taken back to the president and then onward transmission. We now know that both the president and parliament raised issues with with the SEC. Again, when we get to the president, the president did not comply with the 14-day. He didn't comply with the seven-day period. He again did not comply with the 14-day period. His own comments were supposed to be referred to SEC within 14 days. But we now know, we all know that he then referred his, um, his matters after the 14-day period. But Zek did accept those things. The, after Zek has received this, I will read uh, what the Constitution says. Uh, it says that where a preliminary delimitation report has been referred back under subsection 8, this is subsection 9 of section 6, 161. The Zimbabwe Electoral Commission must give further consideration to the matter or issue concern, but the Commission's decision on it is final. What this means is that if there are any uh, areas of divergence between ZEC and the Parliament or ZEC and the President, ZEC is the one that determines what ought to happen. In other words, they can say we agree here, we don't agree there. And then what they say is final. Finality doesn't mean that they cannot be challenged by citizens or cannot be challenged in a court if it goes against the Constitution because the Constitution is supreme. But it cannot be questioned by Parliament or questioned by the President if it makes it clear that this is its final, this is its position on the disagreement. Then they produces a final report which is handed to the president who must then gazette it within 14 days after receiving it. There is a problem relating to what it is that they can uh, give to the president. It must give to the president a final report. The constitution does not have provision for anything else after Zek has received comments to his preliminary report, its next interaction with the president is when it gives the president its final report. That is what the constitution contemplates. There may be room, I'm sure it can be argued, that uh, there's nothing to stop these interactions as long as they do not detract from the fact that the final output is that from, from Zek. As we stand now, I think I also got it from the um, Tofamba there, that um, there are now two versions. The Electoral Commission chairperson says she handed to the president a final report, which would mean that the president must now go to the next stage within 14 days uh, of gazetting that. But the president's office says that they have not yet received a final report. They have received what they are calling a revised preliminary delimitation report. I must make it clear that there is no provision for what is called a revised preliminary delimitation report. In other words, you would not need the ceremonies that we noticed when that uh, last year, um, the 3rd of February, when Zek went back to the president. It wouldn't require that. But this is now a, a, an issue of major constitutional importance 
because if the president believes he has not yet received a final report, according to his own version, he would not have an obligation to gazette uh, that revised the preliminary limitation report. On the other hand, if <coughs> Zek believes it has uh, submitted a final report, Zek would have no basis for submitting anything else. So there, uh, I can easily say that it can create a constitutional crisis if that difference in characterization continues. If one way the president and um, were still wanting to find an opportunity to have that report corrected, and then they would say that they have not yet received the report, that could be an avenue of delaying the processes, in other words, creating an issue where Zeke itself might be forced to get to the public and say, look, we actually acted in terms of the Constitution. Because if we go by the uh, what we heard publicly uh, when the chair was presenting to the president, he cited section 161, subsection 10, meaning that uh, she believes she ended in a final. I'll get back to these things when we debate. But uh, that's an, a, a critical issue. If the president doesn't do <coughs> what is required of him in terms of section 161, subsection um, 11, then, of course, there would be a breach of the constitution by the president. All right. Uh, but it's not as easy. Yes. Oh, I was going to, uh, if you can then uh, wind up that talking point and then we can uh, move to Professor Moyo. Then we can come back again That's to address fine. those issues in the question segment. Thank you very much. I, I was actually looking forward to being regulated. It's very <laughs> difficult with this kind of framework no. to, to know at what point to stop and so on. So I will just have one sentence to say that all I did for this first session has been just to outline the constitutional provision. And as I say, uh, where we are at the moment depends on what happened on the third, uh, whether it was a final report or it was a revised uh, uh, delimitation report which is not provided for in the Constitution. And I wanted to close by saying that that can simply be resolved by the chairperson of the Electoral Commission uh, or the Commission independently, and which is why they are supposed to act without fear or favor. They can come out and tell us all and the whole world that what they submitted to the President was the final report within the contemplation of section 161, subsection 10. If if they do that, then I think things will be clear. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Maduku. Uh, without further ado, we will move on to Professor Jonathan Moyo. Um, unfortunately, we don't seem to have uh, Mr. Uh, Dafazo Mugwadi uh, uh, available on the space, but I think I see uh, Honorable uh, Subanda uh, here as a listener. I will add him as a speaker. Uh, after John, uh, Professor Moyo has uh, completed his uh, uh, submission. All right, Professor Moyo, uh, take it away. Thank you uh, again, uh, moderator. Um, I just want to, uh, without making uh, much uh, of a fuss, but uh, I want to point out that uh, when I was contacted, I was told that uh, I would uh, have 30 minutes and I'm surprised that the moderator is given us 15 minutes. I will try to reduce the 30 minutes to 15, but it might be an impossible task. Nevertheless, uh, I, I, I think that um, this is a, a very interesting topic uh, which uh, ZimLive has come up with for this uh, Twitter space. Uh, it is uh, timely and it is of great national interest. And as I indicated earlier, I thank them for inviting us. May I start by pointing out that um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as a, a practicing uh, politician and uh, someone who has uh, been involved in the teaching and research, of uh, various aspects of political science. I believe that uh, it is tried to say politics is law and law is politics. 
But of course, as specialized uh, disciplines, the two are very different in fundamental and important ways. Nevertheless, with this understanding that politics is law and law is politics, my presentation is, of course, going to be uh, more about the politics of delimitation uh, and, in particular, the politics of the 2023 delimitation report that ZEC has prepared. In one sense, this discussion comes rather late in my view. It would have been more useful had it taken place soon after ZEC presented its draft preliminary uh, delimitation report to the president on the 26th of December, well before the 6th of January when Parliament's ad hoc committee tabled its analysis of the report for debate uh, on the 13th and 14th of January. And that debate then facilitated the submission of uh, Parliament's views to the President on the 19th of January for onward transmission to ZEC. But holding this discussion before the parliamentary process would have perhaps impacted on the content <coughs> of the report that ZEC has prepared. Conversely, this discussion is arguably uh, somewhat premature in that it is taking place before the eagerly awaited publication of uh, the final report expected to come from a, uh, the uh, awaited proclamation the president is supposed to uh, publish in the Gazette, declaring the names and boundaries of the wards and constituencies which ZEC has come up with for election 2023 in terms of section 1611 of the constitution. I say so because the content of the final report is unknown. While we are very keen to talk about this, uh, we really don't know what was submitted uh, on the 3rd of February, February uh, at State House. So that content is not reviewable by the public uh, as of now. However, putting aside the content of the report, what makes this discussion in, uh, uh, significant, in my view, and, and timely, is that it is mainly about the process, the process being used or being followed to produce the final report. This is a crucial point because an often uh, forgotten perennial truth is that process is king. Process is king. Why? because it influences content. The quality of content in politics is determined by the quality of its process. So, regarding the politics of the ongoing delimitation exercise, it is my submission that there is a clear and present risk that the content of ZEC's final delimitation report that the president must publish by 17 February 2023, risks being poisoned, compromised, and rendered unconstitutional to the detriment of the forthcoming harmonized general election, which could become irretrievably illegitimate because of that fact. Now, a development of that kind, whose, pos whose possibility is now looming large in our body politic, would be most unfortunate for the country and therefore, every effort, I believe, needs to be done to avert that possibility. In this sense, that, uh, that, uh, this discussion that we are having today is really critically timely, very, very important, to avert the possibility of having an illegitimate uh, election. So... In my contribution, I unpack the discussion by answering what I believe are three critical questions. Namely, is ZEC a functional body corporate with the capacity to produce the expected final delimitation report as we speak? Secondly, in terms of the Constitution of Zimbabwe, has ZEC submitted its final delimitation report? Lastly, in terms of the Constitution, what is the role of the president 
upon receipt of the ex-final delimitation report. Before I, I, un I unpack these three questions, let me just uh, give a, a, a very brief background to the politics of delimitation of electoral boundaries of uh, wards and constituencies in Zimbabwe uh, in uh, recent times, in fact, uh, since uh, independence. If we put aside the two referendums that we had in 2000 and uh, in 2013 on uh, draft constitutions, Zimbabwe has had 10 elections, which were 1980, 1985, 1990, 1995, 2000, 2002, 2005, 2008, 2013, and 2018. Out of these, only the 1980 independent election did not have delimited electoral boundaries for wards and constituencies. Until the 2008 election, the authority that delimited electoral boundaries uh, by the 1980, of course, was the Delimitation Commission, as uh, Professor Matuku uh, pointed out. Uh, we should emphasize that, uh, that the Delimitation Commission was an ad hoc body that came to life before every general election between 1985 and 2005. What is notable about uh, that uh, ad, ad hoc structure in light of our discussion today is that before 2004, the only permanent body with electoral functions was the Registrar General's Department, which registered voters and ran elections in between, uh, rather registered voters in between elections and then ran elections. The other bodies with electoral functions, namely the Election Directorate, the Electoral Supervisory Commission, and the Delimitation Commission, were always ad hoc in composition and in function. So they came to life only at election time. Now, when ZEC was first set up under an act of parliament in 2004, it did not have the power to register uh, voters nor to delimit electoral boundaries. In 2005, ZEC became a constitutional body under Constitution Amendment number 17 of the former constitution but it was not given the powers to register voters or to delimit electoral boundaries. Under the same amendment, the Delimitation Commission also became a constitutional body, but remained an ad hoc structure that came into life uh, uh, at election or from time to time. The situation changed dramatically in 2007 under Constitution Amendment number 18, which gave ZEC the power to delimit electoral boundaries. The current electoral boundaries of 1,958 wards and 210 constituencies were done by ZEC in 2008 for the first harmonized general election held in Zimbabwe that year. The point to underscore here is that Zimbabwe has a rich background of delimiting electoral boundaries through an ad hoc statutory or constitutional body which comes to life from time to time, as the case now is, every 10 years. It may very well be that expecting ZEC to have, if you look at uh, its functions in the Constitution, 14 functions uh, under Section 239 of the Constitution, which include delimitation, plus uh, a host of other functions which are in Section 5 of the Electoral Act, Maybe ZEC just has too much to chew. Arguably, by its very nature, the delimitation of electoral boundaries is essentially a technical process. It's not technical. The legal provisions are not complex. They are very clear. What is complex is the drawing of those word and constituency boundaries and it's a very technical place, I mean, a, a, a technical uh, function. The fact that it happens now by law every 10 years means ZEC does not have staff, people who sit there every day waiting to do delim delimitation. They just don't have that capacity. That also explains why in the past it was done within a framework of an ad hoc structure 
you look around for the people at the time you are doing the task and you get them seconded. Most of the debate, although appearing political, is in fact technical or is because Zek has not been active in explaining how it technically executed this uh, task. Let me now um, uh, turn to three key uh, questions uh, that I uh, alluded to when I started. Zek, is it a functional body corporate as we speak with the capacity to produce the final uh, report? First, I think it stands to reason that indeed ZEC is a functional body co uh, corporate, uh, that it has the capacity to produce the report. But this question is important and I'm raising it because of the conduct. In fact, I would say of the misconduct of seven ZEC uh, commissioners who, in my view, uh, deserve to be characterized as rogue. I'm characterizing them as such because they have manifestly acted in ways that are contrary to their constitutional oath, which requires them to be independent, and somehow their actions from certain quarters are supposed to lead to a conclusion that with respect to the delimitation exercise, ZEC is not a body corporate with the requisite capacity to produce the required final delimitation report. This is a major, and I would say the most important political talking point. The seven ZEC commissioners clearly seek to invalidate ZEC decisions with respect to the delimitation exercise. And yet, we know the delimitation exercise is not an overnight process. Most, if not all, of the decisions made by ZEC on the delimitation exercise for the 2023 elections were made well before the seven rebellious commissioners joined or were appointed. Yet somehow, they want to be excused from this, those decisions. The fact is they are bound by the decisions which were made when they were not uh, in post. It is, in my view, rogue behavior for the seven commissioners to seek to disown commission decisions and processes at their tail end. They simply have no mandate and no power to do so as individuals or as a group. Tellingly, in their rogue actions, the seven commissioners have not cited any provision of the Constitution or any other law to back up their misconduct. It is, in my view, mind-boggling that the seven commissioners imagine that they can block, suspend, or even overturn constitutional processes uh, purportedly by a resolution made by them or among themselves over a beer or something like that or by a memo to the president. In the circumstances, the obvious question, political question, which has not been confronted, is whether these rogue seven commissioners are still competent to remain in office after violating their supreme oath of office to uphold the constitution of Zimbabwe. Can they still remain? The argument that the seven rogue uh, commissioners did not sign the draft preliminary or even the final delimitation report is politically interesting from a grand standing point of view, but it has no administrative significance. Commission documents are signed by the ZEC chairperson, the presumed legal authority of the commission on behalf of the commission. Anyone who has cared to look into this matter will find that this is the practice that is common there uh, at ZEC, even with respect to reports to parliament or official annual accounts. They are signed by the chairperson. It is unthinkable, in my view, that seven rogue commissioners imagine that they can hold the commission to ransom only and simply because they are the majority. They are seven out of nine. While this is a matter to be handled by lawyers, uh, and to be settled in court. The fact that the two uh, of the seven rogue commissioners 
have uh, tendered uh, affidavits to support a case by a total stranger to Zek and to its core business, thereby dragging the commission into the mud while it is not even cited in the case, just goes to show how destructively naive the lot is. The position of the seven rock commissioners has become untenable. How can they work at Zek while suing the commission by proxy? Who at Zek will ever trust them? There are only two options left for these commissioners, in my view, to resign or face disciplinary action. There is no middle position, and none of these other two uh, options I've just man, uh, 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 mentioned should affect Zek's work. Zek's submission to the, uh, 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 I mean, Zek's submission of the final uh, report. Have they submitted a final report? And is this a matter that uh, uh, we should debate? In my view, it is surprising, unfortunate, and I would say scandalous and dangerous that this question is in the public domain out there. Yesterday, the Herald newspaper carried a story headlined, ZANU-PF cell verification meetings continue. In that story, the paper reported the uh, uh, political member who is also the Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, Comrade Ziambi Ziambi, speaking in Chinoy, and it, it quoted him in this, uh, and I'm quoting verbatim. He dismissed claims that the final draft of the delimitation report was ready. He said the report presented to President Mugabe by Zek was basically for consideration, close quote. On this matter, the facts are public and therefore very clear. No one has made any claim, but what is there is what the chairperson of <coughs> ZEC, Justice Priscilla Chigumba, said, not when she was uh, speaking to journalists after the submission, but what she said to the president directly when she was handing him the final report. She said, and I'm quoting a verbatim, Your Excellency, in terms of section 161, subsection 1 of the Constitution, the concerns which you forwarded to us from Parliament and yourself have been adhered by the Commission. And these are our responses. And this is the hard copy, which is the result of us giving effect to those concerns. Close quote. The operative phrase is that she said, in terms of section 161, subsection 10 of the Constitution. That section says, as soon as possible, after complying with subsection 7 and 9, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission must, must submit a final delimitation report to the president. That is what Zek did on November, I mean, on um, uh, 3 February 2023, last week Friday, when the chairperson of ZEC invoked this section as the uh, authority and handing the final delimitation report to the president. This is not a claim, this is a public fact. With that in mind, what should the president do? In terms of the constitution of Zimbabwe, it's very clear what he, uh, he, he must do. Af and, and, we, and, and let's point to the source of uh, what he thought he needs to do. After the ZEC chairperson, Justice Tugumba, handed the president the final report uh, last Friday, he said, and I'm quoting him verbatim, thank you very much. I will attend to this and make my observations that is what the president said. Now, understandably, people out there can speculate about what the president meant when he said, I will attend to this, or when he said, and make my observations. The speculation is, however, unnecessary, and conclusions from that speculation are irrelevant because the constitution is unambiguously clear about what the president must do not what he may do as of the 3rd of uh, February 2023. What he must do, and this is in section 161, 
subsection 11 of the Constitution, which says, within 14 days after receiving the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission's report, the president must, not may, must publish a proclamation in the Gazette declaring the names and boundaries of the wards and constituencies as finally determined by the commission. What this means, in my view, is that the president must publish Zek's final delimitation report handed to him on 3 February 2023 by 17 February 2023. This is not a claim. It is the legal position based on the factual position. My conclusion, in the circumstances, those who are challenging the legal position arising from the factual position have the obligation to explain themselves. Their stance is at odds with public facts and with the Constitution. As such, their stance is, comes across as a palpable attempt to usurp the powers of ZEC as a Chapter 12 institution an independent constitutional body, which in terms of section 235, subsection 1A, is, I quote, not subject to the direction or control of anyone. And, and this is something which the rogue commissioners need to understand. To send a dear anti roda letter complaining about what's going on to Zek, inviting people to come to rescue them is a violation of section 235 of the constitution, especially subsection 1A. Be this as it may, let me conclude by proffering an explanation why there is an apparent and rather brazen attempt to subvert the constitution by usurping the powers of ZEC in relation to the process of finalizing the delimitation exercise. First, it appears there are some in government, uh, uh, the mandarins in government, especially in the Minister of Justice, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, who are working with these, or some, if not all, of the rogue ZEC commissioners. And those mandarins, in my view, either want to smuggle some content into the final report under the false pretext that what was submitted to the president is a revised draft final report or whatever else they are calling it other than final report. Now, a draft final report is uh, oxymoronic. Uh, and uh, it's, some, it's a phrase that you will not find anywhere in the constitution. So maybe this is to try and find an opportunity to smuggle something into the draft. That's one possibility I see. The other, is that maybe these mandarins are simply kicking the can to buy time beyond 26 February 2023, after which the electoral boundaries in ZEC's final, I mean, uh, final delimitation report would not apply for the forthcoming 2023 harmonized general election uh, in terms of section 161, subsection 2 of the Constitution. Whatever the case, um, comrade moderator, the distractions from a political point of view are not helpful. They are damaging, particularly to Zek. They are presenting a picture of Zek that, or a Zek that is not ready for the elections. A Zek that is uh, prepared to a panda to the whims and caprices of the politicians. Once that impression is created on the eve of elections, Zek will be in an impossible position to run or conduct free and fair elections which produce a legitimate outcome. It is for this reason that I think Zek on this uh, occasion deserves our ear, deserves public support on the process issue, bearing in mind that process shapes content. I thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Moyo, and uh, uh, for teasing out um, these very um, um, uh, concerning issues that I'm sure our audiences would like uh, to examine a bit more closely. So. Um,
I will call upon um, Honorable uh, Sibanda to um, take the floor and I will take the mic and uh, present his uh, party position. Honorable Sibanda uh, belongs to uh, the Citizens Coalition for Change. I noticed that um, Mr. Uh, Mugwadi was uh, 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 present, but I do not see him, but I'm sure that he will join us so that he can also give his party position. So, Mr. Sibanda, I'll give you um, at least 10 minutes uh, to uh, uh, speak through your party position, and then we can uh, revert to questions. We don't have much time, unfortunately, because we also lost time at the beginning. So without uh, further ado, please uh, do proceed. Yeah, thank you so much, Innocent. Uh, but I think allow me to start with a disclaimer and say because of the short notice that we received, and spaces. One cannot simply say that what I'm going to say is the party position, but maybe generally they can be what I'm going to say might represent the majority feeling within my party, but not really to say that it is she didn't get an opportunity to discuss as a political party. No, that's all right. Yes. Um, for a starters, I think uh, the developments that we are seeing in the media uh, that pertain to the process which is supposed to lead to a general election, which is provided for in terms of the law, are actually worrying. They are quite worrying because uh, we do not until there can be anyone who can want to subvert the sovereignty of the people of Zimbabwe because any other conduct that is inconsistent with the provision of the constitution it will be subverting the very constitution it might be a second 17 November 2017, which we don't want, which Zimbabweans are never looking forward to. And as Triple C, I, I think it is safe for me to say we have not really wanted so much to be drawn into the drama and sideshows that we are seeing around here. A preliminary delimitation report was produced and uh, we were given an opportunity as Triple C to say our views through the ad hoc committee that was set up by Parliament in terms of the law. <coughs> and therefore, what we look forward to are processes that are undisturbed that are flaw, flawless towards the election day that is given, I mean, time frame of which is given in terms of the constitution. We, we don't want really to get too much into the, beyond the curtains of what is happening on the, on the, on the, Beyond, I mean, beyond the curtains, or behind the curtains. We don't want to pierce the veil. We want to concentrate ourselves with what is public. And what is public is that uh, we look forward to also be favored with the report that ZEC uh, then have, or which they produced after they had received comments, recommendations, and observations from the ad hoc committee. And of course, those that we didn't get an opportunity also to see, which were made by the president and in terms of the law. So we want them to get a feedback as, a, as an interested party, as a stakeholder. We need to know what became of those recommendations that were put in public so that we can then plan for the elections are back on 
and Zimbabwe want to have that opportunity, which has to come every five years, to determine who is going to govern them. So all these dramas and sideshows, in our view, are highly unnecessary. Uh, if ZANU PF has got its own issues as a political party, those issues should not come to affect the rest of the citizens of this country. And if ZEC has got its own boardroom issues, in my view, uh, if ZEC has got boardroom issues that makes them unable to discharge their constitutional duty, let them come out into the open and advise the nation that we cannot continue to conduct our mandate. And then the nation maybe might have then to converge and say, if Zeki is unable to, con to, to continue with its mandate, whom do we give the responsibility to do that mandate? But we can put down with these side shows, there is a, a, a report that was produced by Parliament. There, I'm sure there were recommendations and observations that were made by President Nangava. Those went to Zek, and Zek then went back to the State House and handed over. And I, I'm sure, as has been indicated, there are no provisions that after Zek has made their consideration, then there will be another stage of anybody else having a second opportunity to comment on what Zek would have done. The Constitution is very clear. Once Zek has made a position, that position is final. Then we then come to the issue of has Zek made a position? So we are being drawn again into the argument of what is happening behind the curtains. And honestly, honestly, every Zimbabwean that uh, is patriotic, that loves their country, I think this is a moment in which everyone has to be sober and put the interest of this nation ahead of whatever personal, sectional, factional interest that might be existing. We need to move this nation forward. That's my view and to me. Well, thank you very much, Honorable Sibanda. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see our fourth speaker, uh, Mr. Tafazwa Mugwadi. I would have um, asked him to address uh, his own uh, party's position as well. And uh, during the discussion, you may have heard... Um, uh, Professor Maduku referred to the uh, spokespersons uh, of the presidency or and government um, giving conflicting uh, positions uh, uh, on the uh, delimitation report or the status of the delimitation report that was presented to the president. Unfortunately, we do not seem to have the opportunity now to hear from the ruling party's position so that at least there could be clarity, hopefully, uh, 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 on that. But um, that leaves us with at least 30 minutes uh, to delve into discussions. I would not um, uh, dare uh, bring up my own questions here because we have quite a few people here who are interested in posing questions to our speakers and getting responses to that. So I will start with um, uh, those who are first in line um, to kickstart our question uh, uh, section. I think, Hulu, you have been here um, for a while, so you can speak now. Um, he's, um, he's still connecting, and uh, hopefully we can get him uh, live. Yeah, please go ahead, Hulu. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Please make uh, the questions short and sharp because uh, we want to get in as much as possible and address some of the issues that we haven't concluded, uh, which the speakers raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prof. Maduku, how are you? This is Hulukani Bila speaking to you. I hope you know me. Uh, my pleasure to see you. And yeah, 
I also want to uh, greet Professor Jonathan Moyer and uh, Prince Dubeko Svanda. Uh, my question is to uh, both of them, Prof. Uh, Maduku as well as Professor Jonathan Moyer. There is a, an organization, a shadowy group that calls itself Team Pachedu. These people are making political pronouncements and claiming to be making corrections to the delimitation report that was submitted by, by the ZEC. They, uh, in one of their tweets, they have mentioned the fact that they are making a corrigendum and an addendum to the ZEC report. I want to find out from you, is that lawful? for a shadowy group whose members we are not aware of to claim to be making corrigendums and addendums to the delimitation report, which was not even final, because by the time they submitted that uh, tweet, the ZEC had not submitted their final report to the president. Is that something that is uh, good for democracy? What is your opinion? with regards to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Over to you, professors. Um, whoever wants to take that question first. I could start, uh, I could start uh, trying to answer that uh, question. Uh, thank you, I think, uh, Mr. Bibi. I think I know you, I'm sure. But I believe that the question is not the proper one to say that is that lawful, because that's a very, difficult question whether something is lawful or not lawful uh, would ultimately be determined by a court so what we can only express would be our own opinion which may not be useful at this stage what is important is that uh, citizens must know the process uh, that we have all put in our constitution that process that the delimitation is by zec zec goes to parliament and the president as we have seen they give a final report to the president. Clearly, in a country with citizens and people with the various political rights and the various freedoms, it shouldn't matter what various groups do. And that what should matter is that we all know that uh, these would be their own positions, uh, these would be their own views, and they must be entitled to express those views. I don't think that there is a citizen who ought to have a justification and say that um, the report by Zek has been corrected by Tim Pachet. Therefore, I mean, that shouldn't be. I mean, for me, I wouldn't take that into account. I would appreciate that Tim Pachet are a group of citizens who are contributing their own political views to the country. Uh, they are trying to make uh, institutions accountable and so forth. I think they should be allowed to express their views and that uh, we have moved a long way from the old uh, processes where we would look at other people as shadow groups or whatever. I think they should be allowed to say that. It doesn't matter who they are. What matters is that uh, they are allowed to debate. Like I have expressed views, Professor Jonathan May has expressed views, uh, the representative of the CCC has expressed views. We should build a country where we know that we think differently, we have uh, different objectives, and that uh, in doing so, they would be. So if you want me to say, is it lawful? Our constitution allows uh, these kind of political activities and these kind of expressions. We know that they are expressing themselves. That is not necessarily the truth. I would recommend that uh, that be the better way of understanding the different political persuasions or the different civic responsibilities we have Let's focus on Zek. Is there a final report now? What does it say? And let's keep making Zek accountable, making the president accountable. Uh, that's what matters. And then as we do that, we should know that we do these things in different ways. That would be my take. Thank you, Professor Maduko. Professor Moyo? Uh, I associate myself with the response that uh, Professor Matuk has just given. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. So moving on to, um, I think we've got Peter. 
Peter, please um, ask your question. And uh, again, keep it short. Uh, we are trying to breeze through as many questions as possible. Just bear with him as he connects. The mic is yours, Peter. We cannot hear you yet. Um, I think we will move on. Uh, Peter seems to be having tech uh, problems, so we are moving on to Thierry. Please take the floor. Yeah, we are having to bear with um, uh, these uh, connection uh, lags and um, unfortunately losing a bit of uh, time and traction as we do so. But uh, please bear with them as they uh, connect. If it takes too long to connect, I will try and move on to the next uh, uh, person and ensure that we, we, we keep uh, the ball moving. Uh, that one has not worked. Uh, let me move on to a second one. Chaka, as soon as you're able to connect, please um, uh, take the floor. Yeah, so my, my uh, good evening, everyone, Professor Maduku, uh, Professor Jonathan Moyo, and Zim Life, uh, whether you are behind the mic there. Um, I didn't quite understand the explanations from the two professors, because... I thought for me the main thing about Pachelu is not what their comments are or how, what um, uh, conclusions they are giving from what they are doing. For me, it's more to do with the uh, fact that I think they were saying they even hacked into the systems and also they, 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 are, consti they, they, they are formed by people who involve uh, foreign nationals like Americans in the group Pachelu. And then we, are, we hear that they are actually hacking into the system. Is that something we can, as citizens, as a country, say, well, there's nothing wrong as long as... <laughs> that's, that's a bit I didn't quite understand. I don't mind what views they may have in the end to say, well, we think this or we've corrected this bit and that. But I think it's how they are doing it and who is doing it with them. I don't know if that changes anything. Thank you. Um. Well, I, I do not... Uh, may, may I comment? Okay. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I think w the, the thrust of uh, Professor Matoku's response was to say, in the context of what we are talking about or discussing today, the issue is about ZEC and the delimitation report, not about the lawfulness or otherwise of anybody else out there who is saying whatever they are doing. But if you were to ask, do we have opinions on Pachedo? I, for one, have, and uh, it's public. I, 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 there are many things that they say which I find useful, but many more things that they say and do which I don't find useful, and some which I find even illegal. Uh, I, I, for example, if you look at the comments they've been making about um, uh, the delimitation, uh, uh, the draft delimitation report, they've written volumes and volumes of things. Some of the uh, assertions they make are blatantly false. Uh, they said, for example, uh, Manika landed 25 uh, constituencies, uh, and 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 that uh, assertion. If you take it, it, leads to a litany of other falsehoods which are based on that. But I think it's it's of not much value to deal with people from the point of view of a policeman's head. The best way in a democratic society is to let institutions of the state do their job and us as citizens, we debate. If you come up with a false thing, which Pacheto does, like we are all Zimbabweans, blah, 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 but meanwhile they have a guy there who is an American and has been working uh, 
for the established uh, establishment in America, you engage them and point these out. Uh, I mean, these things out. But don't give us, don't give Professor Maduku or me the responsibility of the state, and so, so that we become policemen. We rather debate ideas generally, but in particular, I think our focus is on ZEC. I think as a rule-bound institution, if ZEC <clears throat> does its job in terms of the constitution, it will find lots of defenders in society. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Moyo. Um, I will, again, um, we understand that uh, there will be many um, issues uh, associated with the topic uh, that we are, or the themes that we are discussing today, and um, time would not permit us maybe to explore them fully. I see Pachedu are here. I would have given them a right of reply if we were con really focusing on, on that aspect of, of, of this theme. But in the interest of proceeding with our discussion, on the uh, legalities and, and, and politics of the delimitation report and also to address some of the very interesting points that our speakers have raised please let's go ahead and um, and, and 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 focus on that debate and at least uh, leave with a, a better insight on, on on the issues that are uh, in vogue at the moment so cc c nap uh, please uh, go ahead uh, thank you so much uh, zim uh, the host uh, zim life and uh, hello to uh, uh, Prince Dueko and our two great professors. My question relates to uh, what happens if the executive, uh, if the executive tempers with the report uh, before it's uh, before it's gazetted. Uh, what will happen, and is there a way for us as citizens to know if it has been tempered with? Uh, thank you very much. That's the question. Again, um, to our uh, uh, professors, uh, please, whoever needs to go first. I think Hello. Professor Moya can go first. He spoke very strongly about that. Um, he could just uh, get back to what he said. I'm, I'm sorry, moderator, uh, I, I have been caught truant. I had just mm -hmm. taken a moment to get a cup of coffee and I missed the <laughs> question. My, my apologies. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the, uh, the question I wanted to know, what happens if uh, the executive tempers with the report before it is presented uh, publicly? So is there a way to address that? Well, yes, there is a way. The only uh, uh, way I imagine they would temper with it is by uh, not fulfilling their constitutional duty. Uh, uh, if you look at the relevant uh, section, it's not like there's so much the re executive, executive. We are really talking about the president here. And section 161 uh, is very clear, especially section 161, subsection 11. The president has to uh, uh, discharge his constitutional duty. In this case, you see, this is a bit tricky in the sense that, uh, and I think um, there was quite some wisdom on the part of the framers of the Constitution, although some stuff looks like uh, escaped them a bit. The president is presumed to be a player. He has an interest in the election. He is a participant in, in the election. Zek is a ref, is the referee. It is very important for the player to keep out in terms of uh, framing of the rules and uh, regulations of the process. It is in the interest of the president not only to discharge the con the co his constitutional duty, uh, but to be seen to be doing so. The one test that ZEC has been failing uh, since its creation as a constitutional body is the test of transparency. Zek seems too often, more often than it uh, is, is okay for its own good, uh, ready to be opaque, to do things which you never are sure uh, what's happening. Opaqueness is the ban of Zek. And what is going on with this debate is that it is feeding into the traditional opaqueness. 
and the this functionality of ZEC in recent months or weeks is making it difficult for it because a lot of things are being said which are patently false, but ZEC is unable to, to explain. But you can tell, uh, even from a, an ordinary person's uh, perspective, that what is being alleged is not true. I just can't understand, for example, how it is possible that um, a secretary for information can make a statement and say, hello, wait, what happened on Friday was not final. Uh, the nation will be told what is final. And ZEC keeps quiet. When ZEC is an independent constitutional body and a government spokesperson does not speak for ZEC and must not speak for ZEC, must not say that report which ZEC has done and presented is, is just a draft. Only ZEC should be the one who says, hey, we have given a draft. And like Professor Madruko intimated in, the, in his presentation, it may very well be okay within the provided time for ZEC and the president of parliament to engage each other. Are we reading this correctly? Uh, is the comma there and so forth before they, they come up with a, 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 a final report? That, that should be okay. It can only be okay if it's done transparently. But if you, uh, there's this murky and dark uh, uh, stuff that's going on, then this tempering you are uh, insinuating by the executive becomes possible, especially where you have seven commissioners who have written to the executive to say there is uh, uh, horror here, things are not being done properly, and so forth. They can use that as an excuse to, uh, 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 again, to borrow your term, interfere. There is a reason why in the Constitution it says ZEC must be transparent. It's in order to avoid uh, uh, these perceptions, if not realities. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I am reliably informed that our speakers are, uh, are happy to proceed with this discussion at least until 9 p.m. Zim time or 7 p.m. British summer time so we can uh, have more questions come in. Um, I will but take... Which speakers are those? Because I thought I was one of them. I've, I've just been told by my crew behind the scenes that um, the speakers are happy to proceed um, mm -hmm. for at least 30 more minutes past the advertised time. Okay, no, no, that's I'm one of them. Even though I was not consulted, let me also be happy. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, Padare, please um, uh, take the floor. Uh, he's connecting. <clears throat> yeah, please go ahead. Padare, are you there? Y yes, I'm, I'm there. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, um Please proceed. Uh, thank you for uh, availing your time to be with us. Uh, uh, we also thank you, uh, uh, Zim Live. My, my question to you both is, what are the possibility of an early call, of an early election uh, within this period, despite everything that's going on? Yeah, and, and, and Professor Jonathan Moet, many thanks for clearing out about this terrorist group that I always call Pachedu. Many thanks for that. All right, thank you. Uh, professors? What was the question? The que I didn't get it. The, 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 the question uh, I was, I'm putting forward is, what are the possibility of an early call for an, uh, a, a, an election in Zimbabwe right now? We are, could the president call an early election? And, uh, you know, according to the Constitution, is there any provision for that? Uh, there is no provision for an early election uh, of that nature of the president just calling us the the constitution is very clear that um, the only time you can have an early election is if parliament is dissolved earlier than its five-year period and that would require parliament itself by a two-thirds majority to vote um, uh, to dissolve to have it dissolved and so forth 
Um, and then the constitution section 158 is clear that you cannot have an election earlier than, uh, in this case, the last uh, you know 30 days uh, of the uh, existing parliament. So I'm not sure where that thing is coming from. I think it was uh, started by Veritas. There's really no basis for that kind of speculation. Even practically, now where we are, what would be an early election? Uh, perhaps by early election, you mean an election earlier than July? Because the election is going to be due uh, starting from the 28th or uh, July onwards. Mm. Uh, so if you have to have an early election, you mean you just have to do it earlier than 28th July? It will even be misleading to call such an election an early election anyway. But that is not practicable uh, constitutionally. It's very, going to be very difficult to do it. It would mean Parliament doing that. Um, and uh, then when they do it, it must be held within 90 days, uh, which will still almost take you to, to July. Okay, thank you, Professor. I think that one is uh, sufficiently uh, answered. Uh, Bashona. I have added you as a speaker. Uh, please come live. Hello, you can go live now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I've got a question uh, straight to, to Prof. On his, uh, uh, We've got two Profs. Uh, uh, Which one? Uh, Prof Maduk, uh, the, okay. our lecturer. And uh, Professor Moyo, you know, is uh, is one of our, you know, political mind that we always recon to. So my question to Prof. Uh, Maduku is on the case that he took the Parliament of Zimbabwe to court, and in his uh, submission, he said that the the the, the, the people who probably legally answerable, answerable to this matter is the executive and the Parliament. And my question to, to Prof is, why did you leave the other arm of the government, which is the executive, in your, in your court application? Thank you so much. I think, first and foremost, I didn't take um, anyone to court. I have a client who took parliament to court. So, of course, I'll be, I would not comment as much, but I will be able to be useful to the platform to explain that... Uh, this is a person who says that uh, Parliament ought to have uh, considered his petition. He he took that uh, letter by seven commissioners uh, that Professor Moore is calling uh, rogue commissioners and said to Parliament, may you please investigate uh, whether or not this report you are about to debate is a report of the commission or is a report of the few commissioners. Uh, he wanted Parliament to really go to the bottom of the matter. So that's what it is. Then Parliament refused to do that. Parliament argued that uh, it had no business doing that because uh, this report was tabled by the president. So whatever the president tables is from Zek. I'm sure the president is satisfied that it came from Zek. So we're not going to do it. That's what Parliament said. Then the, the my client's uh, answer to that was, ah, you are breaching the constitution, which gives you an obligation to ensure that, uh, so his, his only issue is with Parliament, there's no issues with Zek and so on that's very straightforward, he has no issues with Zek, he has issues with Parliament he's a citizen who knows that uh, Parliament has certain constitutional obligation, now regarding citing Zek and other people uh, it's unfortunate that the Constitutional Court itself has said that uh, whenever you are taking Parliament or the president to court uh, under the process uh, of saying you have not breached your constitutional obligation. Uh, do not cite anyone else. So if you are a, a, a person aspiring to be a law student or something, or you are a lawyer, I'm not sure, you will have to, there's a case called the Muliswa versus Parliament of Zimbabwe. That was the only reason. Without the Muliswa versus Parliament of Zimbabwe case, um, we might have actually cited everyone, uh, but that case is now the authority that says you, can, you should only cite either the president or parliament. <clears throat> it's a judgment number six of, um, I, I'm not sure, uh, judgment number six or judgment number two. I think that one is number two of 2021. 
one. Then there is a judgment number six of 2022, which involves Zim rights, Pesa's Parliament of Zimbabwe. So we have two cases of the Constitutional Court, which uh, are saying that I am aware I've followed some discussions on Facebook or social media saying that uh, what we did was fatally defective. We didn't join ZEC. That is the reason. We'll hear what the court says if someone still wants to revisit that. But that was the reason why I didn't cite Zek on behalf of the client. I was just following the precedence of the constitutional court itself. Oh, but uh, with your permission, uh, moderator, uh, 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 Farmer, okay. I think okay. this is an important issue. Uh, if uh, uh, Professor Matogo does not mind, uh, I don't know whether he had the chairperson of the commission uh, uh, justice uh, on, the, on, on friday last week uh, being asked about this case she publicly complained or uh, was musing in public to say you know uh, there is that case we we're not cited and we are thinking whether to apply to be joined and so forth because the a prayer, a, 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 the order sort affects us, and it does affect them because this is quite different from the other cases that have been handled where Parliament uh, uh, is sued in terms of uh, 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 Section One One Nine. Here, the your your client uh, Prof is saying uh, the court must uh, order that the draft preliminary report is null and void. There was no uh, exercise done because these commissioners were not part of it. Zek must be ordered to start afresh. In the papers of your client, there is that uh, uh, avenue. Therefore, Zek is affected much more than Parliament. It's like a backdoor uh, attack on Zek because you want the very thing that they have done to be set aside. Could you please clarify for us on that? Uh, thank you, Professor Moe. Clearly, I wouldn't mind uh, because if this is a public forum. These things are now public. Uh, it's always, uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, just to explain, because these are the issues that will be debated. I think that I heard the chairperson of the commission complaining publicly. She has a very, it's a very fair point that she was making. And one would feel sorry for a person uh, who is not cited and where things would be. We would not uh, have any problems with them if they were to want to be joined. I think there would be no issue. Like I have said, let me be clear that um, it was our own reading of the authorities that uh, the Concord itself has put across. And perhaps they could make a distinction between our case now and the other cases. But what the Concord has said and I believe perhaps after this, some of you could go and just look at those uh, uh, judgments. Like I said, one of them is judgment number six of 2022. And then the other one is judgment number two of 2021. I think the Molisco one is 2021. They have been very clear that if you are bringing an application um, and, and alleging that parliament or the president has failed to fulfill a constitutional obligation, then just cite that because your attack is on the... But the consequences of a finding, if a finding is made that the president has not com uh, fulfilled a constitutional obligation or parliament has not fulfilled a constitutional obligation, the consequences that whatever then happened, a, a contrary to a, the constitutional obligation would be <laughs> null and void. So you have the consequences visiting you. So I think if they come, we hope that then the, they should, if they come just to be joined, they won't be an enemy of this. What would be an enemy of this, of my client, would be someone who says, you failed to cite the SEC. Therefore, your application is fatally defective. I hope people get the distinction. If my client were to be attacked by anyone, so far Parliament has responded. I'm sure people have seen the response that was filed yesterday. They have not taken up that point. So they agree with the kind of precedence because all those two cases I have referred you to, Parliament was the respondent with others. And they were there when those others were being taken out 
by the court itself. So they have not raised the issue. The parliament is happy for this uh, matter to be considered on the base of his own arguments, hoping that it will defend Zeke. But if Zeke feels strongly, it might be a, an opportunity in this case for the Concord possibly to revise its approach, in which case it will join Zeg without affecting uh, the validity of my client's application. Just for you all to know, I will only fight for my client if someone says your failure to cite Zeg makes the application invalid. Because I'll be saying I didn't cite Zeg because you as a court is saying this. But if you want to join others, no problem. Thank you, Professor Maduku. Um, just to um, uh, throw back into the discussion some of the very interesting uh, uh, points um, raised by our speakers during their presentations, I will uh, take this opportunity to throw a question to you, Professor Moyo, especially because uh, the question I have here is a political one. And uh, without being need needlessly speculative, I saw... Um, Honorable Osbanda did say we do not care or we do not want to lift the veil and um, be consumed with what could be happening behind the scenes. But nonetheless, um, I'm sure that many of the people um, on this platform are very interested in the political intrigues that are quite apparent now um, because we have seen uh, unprecedented you know, actions being taken by um, uh, 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 members of a statutory body you know, charged with overseeing a very important uh, process, you know, preceding our national elections. Um, Professor Moyo, you spoke of, um, I think you, you actually averred to um, a, a, a threat to subvert the Constitution, as it were, uh, and you described uh, 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 these uh, commissioners as, as rogue. Um, what could be happening, especially given that we, we've had uh, two significant spokespersons of uh, 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 the, the executive the information secretary on the one hand and the presidential spokesperson on the other, both coming out with very conflicting statements on the, um, the, the ZEX report. What are the political machinations or maneuvers that could be happening and that have led us to this particular point of confusion as a nation on the eve of elections? I'm sorry, uh, my phone had locked me out there, but uh, um, I heard your question. Um, well, I, I, you are asking a, a factual question, yet you are inviting speculation about that type of factual question. Because you want us uh, uh, to unveil what is behind the veil. I mean, people can see that there is uh, something going on. <laughs> Uh, uh, but but nobody is coming out to say this is going on. This this uh, very important discussion uh, you are hosting is a Zim Live uh, a platform, and Zim Live has been publishing stuff about this, uh, saying that what is happening has to do with factions, this faction, that faction. Maybe you should. Direct that question to, to, to Zim Live because they seem to have. Uh, unfortunately, uh, our unfortunately, host... Mr. Mugwadi is not present uh, for uh, uh, to, 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 to give a categorical position. No, no, no. Uh, not Mr. Part. Gwadi. Zim Live. Zim Live has been reporting saying that there is uh, uh, some factionalism going on. I, I, I think the best we can say in a, mm. a platform like this where uh, objectivity is important is that we don't know what is happening. Uh, no, that's a fair uh, point. But clearly something is happening. If you, uh, 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 if for the sake of discussion, if you reflect back uh, in the interesting debate that took place in Parliament, uh, you know, as that debate was going on and uh, members of ZANU-PF, uh, uh, the MPs from ZANU-PF were contributing, I just started wondering what had happened at the caucus, because there was a ZANU-PF caucus uh, before, before that, because people were really, really animated, you know. Uh, mm. What we have learned 
in this uh, round of delimitation, uh, which um, uh, I think we should uh, thank the the new constitution uh, in terms of the provisions that um, open up. This provision of going to parliament and so forth was there in 2008, but it, but it didn't play out because 2008 is the last time we had delimitation. It didn't play out in the manner this one has. In fact, in 2008, uh, Justice Chueche, who was the chair uh, of the uh, delimitation exercise, uh, uh, even tried not to publish at all. Uh, uh, and in fact, a proclamation for the election was made and so forth, and they, 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 they had not published the report and I went to court uh, to, to force him to publish. And I was joined by um, uh, 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 Margaret Longo. Uh, and just before our matter was heard, they decided to publish because we wanted to know the boundaries, the description, and so forth to facilitate nomination. But I think what has happened this time is that uh, the the... Uh, uh, MPs, aspiring MPs, and uh, these political interests have really gotten interested in the boundaries, the word boundaries and constituency boundaries. Uh, and, and this uh, delimitation exercise, unlike um, uh, the, certainly the 2008, the 2008 was like Father Christmas. That's when constituencies moved from um, 120 to 210 so every province was getting more constituencies everyone mm. and 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 the way they would say uh, we applied this uh, formula uh, pretending it's arithmetic uh, formula and we therefore are giving around 11 more constituencies it was like oh they are distributing confetti and so forth but this time things are staying the way they are however there's a lot of collapsing of words and, uh, and, and um, constituencies. And you hear chiefs just uh, really furious uh, when they're told that, no, this one has shifted boundaries there. We have collapsed this one. We're changing the name of the constituency uh, uh, and so forth. And there seems to be a, a confusion due to poor civic education between the administrative boundaries and electoral boundaries. Uh, because you get a chance say, oh, my people here have been moved to that and so forth. This exercise has not changed administrative boundaries, but it has changed political boundaries, electoral boundaries, so to speak. And the reaction by the, the local reaction is making some people start imagining that someone has a political agenda for this or that purpose. And then it is common in politics. If you want to win an argument, it's like the German thing, you want to, to kill a dog, allege it as rabies. So if you want to fix a political opponent, or maybe you don't want a primary election, you must allege that this guy is pursuing factional politics, he's working with so-and-so, he's against the president and so forth. Then you get this kind of confusion. And that's why it's really important for rule bound institutions in this case, ZEC, to be stickler for the law, to play it by the book, so that people stop playing uh, politics and so forth. But otherwise, uh, moderator, I think the, the, the correct view uh, or response to this exciting question about why wh what's going on, it's really, um, uh, uh, we don't know. I have to say, it's increasingly coming out that the new commissioners, and this is unfortunate for our country, that an important body like uh, ZEC with nine commissioners, you have a, a, a strange situation, which I, in my view, my humble opinion, we should not allow, where the majority, a, a hoping majority uh, of commissioners are new. These seven came around July, you leave two. Of the two, one who is the deputy came about a year ago. So the only one with memory and so forth is the chairperson. 
it, 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 this thing of a whole, wholesale kind of thing, it shouldn't happen. Because you have uh, these mafikis or laws wanting now to reject the process, but they are complaining that since they were appointed in July, they were promised uh, all kinds of packs, conditions of service, you know, uh, four by four, this, that, and so forth, which they have not been given. Uh, and there is a, a very strong uh, suggestion that they are trying to use this process because they feel that the, the chairperson hasn't been very helpful to them. Uh, so they are trying to use this process. Uh, they are basically acting like some kind of a trade union uh, with a genuine unfulfilled conditions, but misplacing them to poison a constitutional process, which is very important. And then they seem not to understand, but uh, they seem also to then link with certain political interests and so forth. Uh, I think very soon, the, some of uh, the dynamics playing behind the scene will start playing out. And some of it is, in my humble opinion, very frivolous. Thank you, Professor. Um, I'll move on to Dr. Innocent Batsani Ngube, uh, one of the people who've been waiting uh, for quite some time to speak. Please go ahead, sir. Um, uh, good evening. I hope that you can hear me. Yes, loud and clear. Go ahead, sir. Uh, okay, thank you, moderator, and uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Moyo and Prof. Maduku um, and uh, Honorable Dureko. So, my, I would like to take up uh, Professor Moyo on his uh, uh, this statement that uh, process matter. Um, so, on the 23rd of January, the Zach Chapers had met the president to receive um, what they said were the president's views on the on the delimitation report. And I would like us to to quote her uh, verbatim as reported in the Herald. Uh, she said that um, um, what we expect is sometime next week we will have a draft ready, which will be which will be the privilege of His Excellency the President to review before we print a final report, which he will then gazette at his convenience, close court. So um, two uh, quick questions arise from, from this uh, court and also from what, what happened. The first one, I just want to understand from Prof. Mo and also from Prof. Maduk, of course, that uh, was the president within his uh, constitutional ambit to submit separate comments to ZEC from those that had been submitted through the parliamentary process. And then secondly, is the confusion on the finality of the report stemming from uh, Justice Chigumba's statement on the roadmap that uh, she uh, and her commission were going to present what she, she called a draft uh, that uh, the president would review. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nube. Uh, Professor Moyo first, and then uh, Professor Maduku. Thank you, uh, moderator. Um, and thank you, Dr. Nube. Uh, uh, for 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 you you have a way of making your own points uh, in the form of a uh, of a question, um, and I guess you want a confirmation of, of the the point you are making. It's very clear what you are, yourself are suggesting. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, uh, and this is coming uh, up, I think, for the second, uh, for the for the third time, because it was initially mentioned by Professor Maduku, uh, uh, and I uh, intimated to, to it, because I think um, uh, the, the 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 question as to whether 
there can be some interaction between the parties, the president, the Zach, uh, or even parliament for that matter. I think from a, a rational point of view, we should say yes. Uh, uh, and and, and um, I don't see anything wrong with that statement uh, uh, made by the chairperson on, 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 on that occasion. Uh, especially given what she then said on the 3rd of February. She was very clear and very procedural. Uh, if you listen to uh, the, the, the clip that is widely available, which where it's like a, a ceremony being performed, like they were seated there, treating, laughing, uh, talking about the weather, and then all of a sudden, let's do the work, cameras on, and you know, uh, what she says is very, very important, because she speaks like a you would expect uh, not just a lawyer, but a judge. She says, Your Excellency, in terms of Section 161, subsection 10 of the Constitution, the concerns which you forwarded to us from Parliament and yourself have been addressed by the Commission, and these are our responses and this is the, the hard copy. And she's saying that as she's giving him. This is the hard copy, which is the result of us giving effect to the consent. I think this is very important because she's saying this is the final draft. Whatever she may have said about, uh, uh, I mean, not final draft, a uh, final report, whatever she might have said earlier is, is, is irrelevant. Uh, what is relevant is this ceremony being performed in terms of the Constitution and leaving no doubt what she's handing to the President is, that this is the, the, the you know. So I don't think that there's a, a, a need for us to split our hairs and so forth. It's very clear they've submitted a final report and they said so to the President and he had them. What is interesting is your other question, uh, which I think Professor Maduku might be in a, in a better position to, 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 uh, to address because uh, it, 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 it's, it's, in, it's a legal issue uh, about um, the, uh, Section 161. And then, uh, you know, my, my own feeling, and, and I, uh, over the last week I found myself uh, really unhappy with myself that during this process, uh, the process of uh, making this new constitution, we had lots of debates and so forth about this. This part of it escaped me uh, because I would have uh, uh, really kind of raised it uh, in a serious way because we had a lot of opportunities to do, to do this. This idea that the president re uh, uh, makes different uh, 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 proposals or, or comments on the draft uh, uh, preliminary report uh, is now, as I look at this, uh, very problematic. And when I read section 161, I don't find where it says the president should give a separate report. I f I, my, my take is that the president is a post office. The ZEC gives uh, him the, the report, he gives parliament uh, there are timelines, then Parliament uh, gives back to him, and then he gives it back, and then Zeki comes back and give, give him uh, the final, and, and now he must publish that. But to say, to, to have him give a separate one, when in fact the leader of uh, the House is his minister, uh, handles government business in Parliament, when he speaks, uh, makes contributions, answers questions. We would like to think he's doing so on behalf of government in general and the president in particular. Uh, to, it's, it's problematic to have another... Uh, the president's uh, view, feelings should come to parliament and be debated by parliament, come to parliament via the Minister of Justice, uh, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs. Now, I understand that 
uh, uh, his own contributions were much more voluminous than the uh, analysis from Parliament. That's number one. Number two, perhaps because of that, I understand Zeg took 20% of, uh, of what they took in terms of uh, these views came from the president's uh, submission and only, no, 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 the other way around. 20% parliament, 40% from, from the president's uh, suggestions. It begs the question, what are these uh, uh, submissions, even from parliament? Why, are they, why don't they make them um, uh, available? Why does ZEC not put these uh, suggestions, because they are going there as suggestions, and ZEC, in terms of section 161, is the final say. Why doesn't ZEC put them in the, uh, on their website? Uh, for read only, so people don't talk or whatever uh, things, so that uh, we can see. So I hear you there, uh, 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 Dr. Ngove. I think in the, in the interest of, of uh, enriching our uh, body politics, this is an issue. The president should not be entangled in this make comments and so forth because he's a player. Uh, and then Zek must always pass the transparency test. They, they, when they are dealing with things like this, limitation uh, issues, election issues, they must not be secret things, uh, uh, dark, dark room things. Everyone, including uh, general members, pro voters, prospective voters, ought to know who has said what, so that when they see something there, they can relate to its source. But uh, as to the legality and what section uh, provides uh, or enables the president uh, to make these uh, submissions and so forth, uh, I defer to Professor Matu. Um, uh, uh, my apologies that I might preempt uh, uh, Professor Maduku. I keep seeing uh, Mr. Mugwadi uh, coming on and dropping off, and I've been trying to get him to speak. Um, if he should uh, be available, we might um, uh, give him uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, speak. And if uh, those who are interested in staying on, even past, past uh, the last seven minutes that we have here, we'll be happy to extend the discussion a bit further. So um, let me move on to one of the people that have been waiting for quite some time, uh, waiting, oh, Tafazwa is around, is back. Let me, Comrade Mugwabi, Mugwabi, we've been waiting for you. Please go ahead and uh, address uh, all of the key issues that you've heard, uh, especially those relating to your party. And please do share uh, your, your party's position on this uh, very uh, uh, interesting matter. Are you there, Mr. Mgwadi? Yeah, I think um, he seems to be having uh, connection uh, problems, uh, but um, if he should have a stable connection soon, I can uh, bring him back on. Um, let me move on to uh, Knife NFT. He's uh, been waiting uh, for quite some time as well. Please do share your views. And um, let's move the discussion on. <laughs> Hello, are you there, Knife NFT? Uh, he seems to be having connection problems as well. Um, uh, I'm going to pass over Mr. Abdudu Zimatutu <laughs> and uh, move on to Tom has been waiting also for quite some time. Let's see if we, he can connect. Tom, uh, you are... You've got the mic now. Please go ahead. Tom Wonga, uh, can you hear me? 
Oh yeah, now I can. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. I think there's an issue when you get uh, people connected just before you ask them to speak. Uh, they don't hear you, actually. That's what will be happening. Uh, let me give uh, thanks okay. to the professors. Thank you for giving us access to you. Uh, we really appreciate you and Mr. Spanda, uh, the panelists, and yourself, uh, host. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Professor Moyo, I am... I am I'm, I'm in agreement with your synopsis, and I think I, I missed much of it, and I completely missed Professor Madugus. I only caught the tail end of yours, but uh, and I'm I, I'm in agreement with uh, what you just said concerning. Uh, I was also surprised and concerned when nobody was talking about the president's separate submission to the commission, but I wonder how different that is from what you say is permissible for the president to have interaction with Zach uh, on the same uh, report before it is given as final. You seemed to suggest that it is also permissible for the president to be in contact with Zach. So like after the, the report has been referred back to Zach, you seem to suggest, <laughs> Professor Moyo, that there can be a back and forth between the president and Zach, and that is permissible from the constitution. And I wonder how different that is from uh, this uh, also liberty you are you are you seem to have a problem with that the president took of uh, submitting his uh, observations and recommendations separate from parliaments. Uh, for now, I think for the sake of time, I'll, I'll stop there. I don't know, uh, moderator, whether yes. uh, it, this may not be the, the right time to ask Professor Matuku. I, I appreciate uh, the question is directed to me, but the issue started with Professor Matuku, uh, and I, I agreed with him, as I indeed do, that uh, if you have an arrangement uh, where people are making submissions and uh, you are processing their submissions, it's rational to expect that there could be engagement where questions are asked. What did you mean by this? What do, we don't understand this, because uh, uh, the, the, the the democratic process is an interactive process. But as to who takes what responsibility, it should be very clear that the constitution says Zek has a final uh, say, and that uh, when they present to the president their final report he has an obligation to publish it without uh, further ado. But, but Professor Matuku, please, uh, I hope I didn't misunderstood you, uh, misunderstand you rather uh, when, when you made this point earlier on. Okay, I think I can, yeah, I can come in moderate if, if that is possible. Yes, yes, please, okay. please go ahead, yes. Yeah, um, I think uh, Professor Moy understood me well and uh, that he, we are in agreement on that point. For as for the constitutional provision, it's quite clear there in section 161, subsection 8, uh, paragraph A, which says that within the 14 days, the president may refer the report back to the Electoral Commission for further consideration of any issue or of any matter or issue, and then B, either house may resolve. So it's clear that either the both the president and parliament have a right constitutionally. Then the issue of uh, interaction. It's, it's perfectly conceivable, in fact, contemplated by the Constitution, that you could be having these back-and-forth interactions and seeking clarity. It's not supposed to be a technical straight jacket because these are political processes. Let's assume that Zeke may not be understanding what Parliament is saying in its submission. Surely they should be able to interact and say, but look, let's say that oh, all debate on the 20% variance and so on. Is a matter that can be a back and forth interaction. But what ought to be underlined, which has not happened, and there I am sure we are in we are actually in agreement again with Professor Moya that these must be transparent processes. And the transparency means we it's not the secret. Zek must tell the country, must be open. We have interacted with the president over this. These are the issues they publish it. For now. One must not blame the president. The president would not publish what he has given to Zek. 
I think but Zek must publish what it has been given by the president. That appears to be a better reading of um, the situation. You give it to Zek, Zek must publish what it got from uh, parliament, what it got from the president. Then the two documents they sent back to the president, those that have become a center of uh, some controversy. Zek must publish those things. Uh, and these are things that... Uh, so Zek must not be secretive. It must be very transparent and independent. And let's see these politicians saying, I, I never meant that for uh, public consumption. I would assume that that is what has to happen. But then regarding the question that someone else had indicated, remember that um, the chairperson of ZEC had indicated that she would give the president a draft before the final draft. Then I think that that didn't happen. Uh, and then we have what the, appears to be a conflict. But the answer to that conflict is very simple. As far as the constitution is concerned, Zek must come out in the open and say, we submitted to in terms of that section that the uh, um, that, uh, that the chairperson quoted when she was giving those uh, documents to the president. I think that we all know, uh, perhaps I should emphasize it, that politicians of all kinds, uh, with, be they in parliament or in the president, will always try to push their political viewpoint. It is the law, the constitution, it is the public that will stop them from doing so. Don't expect that these people would be, uh, I mean, they are not angels or even try to be very good. They will try to push them. So Zek must know that the president might want to outmaneuver them. But they cannot sit there and say, let's see what the president does. We told him on day one. They must do it over and over again. If they feel they submitted a final report and they know that we are debating these things, at the end of this discussion, and now, convener, they should know that it's an issue. It has been raised by many people. We as the speakers have raised it. Then what stops Zek tomorrow from making that position clear? But also what stops journalists or the media uh, from then going and probing that issue, I'm not, why are we not reading these things? I mean, Matutu is here. I think he's organizing this thing. Go to see the, the uh, uh, Justice Chigumba and ask her directly, did you submit a final report under Section 161, Subsection 10 of the Constitution in view of the fact that the President's office is saying something different? It should be straightforward, that. Those be my contributions. May I close by saying uh, that, uh, convener, I, I I was constrained in one way. Where, uh, although I answered questions because of that conflict of interest over the case I'm uh, representing someone in the concord, I was unable to yes. say a thing about um, uh, what was coming up about those so-called rock commissioners and so on. I didn't want to comment. I will not comment because although I represent my client. Uh, uh, somewhat, their meta is at the center of their uh, of it, it, or their meta is at the center of that application. So, I, I I didn't want to comment, but I took note of what was being said. No, thank you, thank you, Prof. And um, uh, let me rush on to Professor Feresu. Uh, please uh, pose your question. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, convener. Hello, Prof. Moy and Prof. Maduku and everybody else here. I appreciate having the chance. I'm going to ask as a lay person, so what is the take-home message we are getting from this town hall? Was delimitation a bad idea or is it a good idea? Number one. Number two. What are the implications of the delimitation in this process? Does it mean that the elections can take place or not take place? Number three, what are we, what are the things as the lay people we should be now advocating for since the delimitation report has gone to the president second time? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, our, our speakers, uh, you can take it in turn. Hello, Professor 
since the, we, we, we were at the at UZ together in the late eighties, it's always good to um, cross paths in such platforms. Uh, has it has it been good? I I, I think uh, from my point of view, I think under the circumstances. Um, given that um, uh, there were there was um, uh, COVID for two years, uh, which made uh, a lot of processes of this nature difficult. Given that there was a, a mini general election uh, last year, which required ZEC uh, to be vigilant to provide uh, as credible uh, a, a process as. Uh, uh, required by the law, given the resource issues for ZEC, uh, and given that um, they started uh, this process uh, uh, late last year, in earnest, maybe around uh, September, given that other bodies that should have uh, provided key information like uh, stats for the census, a uh, final census result, didn't do so, uh, that report is still not available. We have to say uh, ZEC has done a, 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 a reasonable job. Um, a, a, I, I myself, on this delimitation issue, I, I, I am of the view that ZEC has, has tried its best to be guided uh, by the law, and uh, I consider the delimitation uh, exercise to have uh, been uh, done well. Uh, uh, I obviously, uh, I'm in the same position with everyone else. I, I don't know what the actual content of the final report uh, is. But the fact that, uh, for me, the fact that uh, in any case, although the boundaries have changed uh, uh, virtually everywhere, the fact that except for Mat South, which uh, lost uh, one constituency, and Harare, which gained one constituency. Uh, every uh, other province has uh, uh, retained the constituencies that they got uh, in 200, I mean, uh, uh, the, um, out of the 210 allocated in 2008. For me, equity among regions uh, is very fundamental. In this uh, episode, I have been, uh, uh, I would say, uh, encouraged that ZEC took the uh, uh, criteria that is um, uh, in one, uh, I mean, section 161, uh, subsection um, uh, 5, seriously. I know that some compatriots have wanted the process to be like an arithmetic uh, mathematical exercise. I think that we need to pay more attention to those factors which are in section five. And I, I, I'm reasonably uh, comfortable that ZEC has done that. And that's why uh, we didn't see the Matabeleland provinces uh, losing uh, too many constituencies as some people wanted them to do. Um, uh, and and, and I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, in, in encouraged by that. And I, I'm, I'm happy to answer your first question by saying it's been done well. Equity is not just between constituencies. It's between provinces and regions. And it's important that uh, those factors are seen for what they are. They affect a formula. They require an exercise of judgment and discretion in relation to marginalized areas. And I would like to commend that for having done that uh, very well in this uh, episode. The implications are that we should stick to the process. Uh, right now, the questions that are being raised suggest that uh, the process might be affected. And by process, I mean the process that is in the in the uh, in, uh, under section 161 of the constitution and then um the la the last question uh, uh, i think that it's important 
for the president to publish the final report by the 17th of February if the uh, new boundaries, electoral boundaries, are to take effect for the next election. If that is not done, then we will be stuck with the old boundaries. It is prima facie uh, unreasonable to think that there have been no changes within these uh, constituencies and wards over the last 16 years. There is a reason why limitation should be done every 10 years. It hasn't been done for much longer than 10 years. It will be unfortunate for the forthcoming election to be run uh, in, uh, in terms of the existing uh, electoral boundaries. So really for the voters, prospective voters, citizens at large, to know the new boundaries and be familiar with them, it's important to publish uh, uh, the proclamation of the names uh, uh, of, of these boundaries. That's what I think about your three questions, Professor. Thank you. Hello? 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 Hello, Tadini, are you... Please go ahead, Tadini. Hello, Tadini. Tadini, you can proceed, and uh, after you, Richmond, and, uh, and then Zenzo. Uh, that Tadini seems to be offline. Uh, Zenzo, are you ready? Oh, yes, yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, um, good evening, Professor Moyo, uh, Professor Matuku, and uh, Honorable. Yes, my, my, mine is a quick question, very straightforward, um, concerning the process of delimitation. Why does Section 161 require the use of water registration figures? if constituencies and wards are so expansive and you have to save even people that do not have a right to vote like children. So why is it that we should wait for voter registration or why should we use voter registration figures instead of using um, census figures as a way to determine where constituencies should end and start? Thank you. Thank you. Professors? Professor Majuku, I, I think the, Professor yes. Yeah. yeah, please go uh, ahead. Well, I think that uh, I hear where the, the question is coming from, I think the logic. Our only problem now is that it is the constitution that says uh, we should use um, the registered voters, but we must also take into account the population. Uh, so these are some of the provisions in the constitution sound contradictory. But from what <laughs> Professor Moe said, um, which has been taken into account and is a matter that uh, must be kept at the back of everyone's mind is that you have to look at, at a regional equity, a regional balance and so forth, which is what has happened with, the, I'm not sure what the final report says, but it was quite apparent that uh, Zek decided that they would not want uh, to disadvantage certain region, uh, uh, etc. I'm not also sure whether that was would be supported by the population in some of the areas or the respects. These are, it's, 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 you have to strike an appropriate balance. So as to the question really posed, it's just the answer is, well, it is the constitution that says that. But the constitution does not stop Zek uh, from taking into account the, all the useful political factors that would ensure that we get a fairly balanced and, uh, uh, I mean, balanced the limitation uh, process, which will also ensure that we have uh, stability and uh, we enhance our democracy. 
Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, Tandazani, please go ahead with your question. Tandazani, are you ready? Tandazani Moyo, are you are you ready to ask your question? If not, uh, we move on to Taffy Taffy J. Please, can you can you proceed? Uh, please ask your question. Taffy, are you are you ready? Uh, while these are getting ready, um, I wanted to bring back uh, uh, Honourable uh, uh, Prince Tubeko. Uh, please, if you are able uh, to, uh, I will uh, add you as a speaker so you can um, address some of your party's positions uh, uh, concerning uh, this delimitation. I think the question that I would pose to you so that when you are ready, you can come uh, back on this is uh, we've heard... Um, uh, your spokespersons um, uh, alluded to the fact that uh, they would need to have first the voters' role in order for them to uh, critically assess or analyze the delimitation report. Um, I know that you have said that you did not get a chance to 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 to, to maybe agree uh, uh, on speaking uh, or maybe messaging with uh, with your party, and that you can't fully speak on behalf of CCC as such. But I think, uh, in your best estimation, on what uh, you and your colleagues within CCC. Uh, 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 see or the standpoint that they have, you might perhaps maybe share uh, your views on some of the issues that have been made public or sentiments that have been made public already from CCC. So um, I will bring you on board. Uh, in the interim, Taffy J, if Taffy is not ready, we've got uh, Daba. Daba Vicky, are you, are you ready, sir? Yes, first. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Hello to our guest, Professor Jonathan Moyo, Professor Matugu, and uh, Prince Tubego. Uh, actually, <clears throat> given the furor that erupted in Parliament after the submission of the delimitation report, it's evident we are headed uh, for a uh, a disputed election. What legal recourse do citizens have to stop that from happening? Secondly, I wanted to hear a proper definition of what a, ter a terrorist is. Because I've heard uh, numerous occasions from my colleagues from the other side that anybody who talks against uh, what they wish is a, a terrorist. Like Tim Pachedu is labeled a terrorist. We are also labeled terrorists because we speak against what they wish. Can our learned professors give us the definition of terrorists and not forgetting in their definition and not forgetting uh, the killing part of people in terrorism? Thank you. Thank you, Daba. Our professors. Uh, let me say, um, uh, moderator, that um, the animated debate we saw in Parliament and perhaps in other sections of society was very healthy. That's what you expect of a democracy. It should, there should be more of that. And there is no basis, in my humble opinion, whatsoever to conclude from that, that therefore there's going to be horror or as uh, was suggested by the speaker uh, to suggest that we are headed for a disputed election. Um, I, 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 I think uh, it was uh, pleasing to see members of parliament first in the ad hoc committee and uh, uh, in the uh, flows of both houses, that kind of debate. It was a good thing. Um, uh, that's how democracy uh, grows. But the other question, 
probably requires a legal def definition which only Professor Maduku can give. Thank you. Uh, Professor Maduku. Well, I'm sure that uh, from the answer given already, there is no basis for us to say that there will be a disputed election. I mean, what we have been witnessing is really growing <coughs> and a deepening democracy. And uh, I mean, like what we are involved in now, I mean, since seven, we are still in a discussion. I mean, this is what ought to happen. So there's no reason why we should offer any legal advice uh, in respect of someone who thinks there will be a disputed election. I think for now it's premature to even look at that. Um, you you would not be able to satisfy anyone uh, easily that there will be a disputed election. But if anyone feels that there are things that uh, are likely not to be conducted in terms of law, yeah, the law allows uh, anyone to approach a court if you want to do by a court. Then obviously there are also political solutions if you feel that certain things would not happen in any given way. But for now, I would certainly recommend that uh, we concentrate on the processes that we are involved in now, rather than to start imagining that uh, elections are going to be disputed. Thank you, Professor. We are in the last eight minutes of our uh, discussion now. So, Liberty, a quick question from you, then Tafi, then our yellow. Um, we proceed in that manner. Liberty, are you there? Liberty, you can connect now. Unfortunately, uh, he seems to be having uh, tech issues. So, Ara Yellow, you can proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, host. Um, thank you, the panelists, Professor uh, Moyo and uh, Professor Maduku, the Honorable. I have got a question, a follow-up question on uh, what uh, Professor Moyo presented relating to, okay, the assumption that, okay, Zek, from what they said, they want, uh, they, you know, took into account regional equity or balance. Let's assume that they strongly pursued that uh, approach are we going to see consistency in that approach given the fact that uh, we may say they tried to serve certain regions or provinces uh, uh, from uh, losing constituencies but when we now see certain constituencies that are even over the threshold, way above the threshold, being collapsed, you know, um, and also given the fact that uh, such constituencies, uh, when we track, there is a pattern that... Uh, such constituencies, you know, were won by the opposition in the previous election. Uh, uh, Yellow, Doesn't that I, really reflect? Can I ask you to just hit the, the bullseye and so we can move on? We don't have much time. So so they can yes. respond. Doesn't that reflect bias on the part of Zek? Given what we say, if we say they, are, they were applying regional equity approach, but when they collapse constituents that they've got, you know, number of voters that are far above the threshold. Okay, all right. Are we not so, going to see I, bias in I their think, approach? Thank you. I think, yes, thank you. Um, before uh, you answer the question, I thought I had seen uh, uh, Tafaza Mugwadi back on online. Uh, we've been trying, oh, he's, he's been traveling, unfortunately, so he's not had stable internet connection. So that's why we've not been able to bring him on board and he's been uh, connecting and falling back. But if he does, then we will perhaps maybe include him on the uh, closing remarks. So to the question that's just been asked, um, could one of the professors give a quick response? And after that, I would ask, uh, starting with um, 
uh, Honorable Sibanda, to give your last summations of uh, this discussion, Honorable Sibanda, then to Professor Maduko, Professor Moyo, and um, then we can conclude. Thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, the question was directed to me if there was a question. Uh, I, 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 I think that um, uh, we have to be clear. Uh, there were a lot of, que of issues raised in Parliament, first by the Ad Hoc Committee and uh, uh, Parliament uh, as a whole, uh, <coughs> which uh, uh, addressed various issues, including this uh, uh, problem that was cited uh, uh, in many provinces of uh, merging or collapsing constituencies, uh, cons constituencies and so forth. We have to wait for the final report to discuss content. And that is why in my uh, remarks, I said I was going to uh, focus on the process, uh, which is still uh, uh, open. I earlier on uh, a, chap, a moderator referred to these other factors. I had actually mistakenly said uh, they are in, uh, in subsection five, it's under subsection six. Let us remind ourselves, it says in dividing Zimbabwe into wards and constituencies, the Zimbabwe Electoral Commission must, in respect of any area, give due consideration to its physical features, the means of communication within the area, the geographical distribution of registered voters, any community of interest as between registered voters, and importantly, in the case of any delimitation, any delimitation after the first delimitation, existing electoral boundaries, and uh, uh, lastly, the population. Uh, you know, there was something serious done in 2008 allocating con constituencies. The idea that you can start taking away constituencies from regions and giving other uh, provinces without giving due consideration to these factors could be problematic, especially when it comes to marginalized areas. That's the point I was making. And Zeke has done that. Once you do this, your mathematical formula must necessarily change. That's the point I was making. And I, and I really feel that Zeke, based on the draft preliminary report, uh, delimitation report, that is, they did a good job. And when a constitutional body does a good job in terms of this fundamental devolution issue, we have to commend and encourage them. That's the only point I was making. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, hope we give you the opportunity to ask the last question before we go to our speakers to sum up and close. Uh, thank you very much, Chofamba. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the two professors, uh, member of parliament for for triple C. Uh, I've, I just have one question. Uh, Professor Maduku, you have clearly started this report because you are representing someone who has issues with it. My question to you is, you are also a political player, a presidential candidate, so you also have an interest in making sure that the report is what it's supposed to be beyond you just being a lawyer. Are you truly satisfied with the report in terms of what needs to be done or what should have been done in order to deliver a free and fair election that is not contestable? And to Professor Moyo, my question is that I, I heard you say that um, there's a lot of technical issues involved in uh, this kind of exercise, the delimitation exercise. Um, as, as a political scientist, do you think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's reasonable to have a delimitation process to go and discuss it in parliament, uh, members of parliament discussing it, when none of them, except the president and Zach, have got a voter's role in their hands? How do you decide or actually question or see whether something has been done properly when you do not have a voter's role in your, in your hands? Thank you, Chofamba. Thank you, Hope. Our professors... Uh, maybe mine was the, uh, the easier one. I, I leave uh, the pro uh, Professor Matruko to answer the more complicated one. <laughs> um, uh, yes, the, the exercise, the delimitation exercise is necessarily 
a technical one because it is in straight specific terms about drawing ward and constituency boundaries and describing them and you need technical tools for doing that uh and 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 i was saying i think because it's done once in a while once in 10 or so years in this case 16 years later zec does not have people sitting there uh, every day uh, as delimitation experts these delimitation experts are found at universities and so forth the nine, the 2008 delimitation exercise had two very critical uh, experts uh, who even uh, designed uh, uh, proper mapping methodologies and so forth uh, and came up with a database and they were led by the late uh, professor uh, maclean bala who was the vice chancellor at lupani state university and uh, professor amon murira who is now the minister of higher education who was then at the university of zimbabwe um I think that um, uh, you, 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 these are not fixed people. You need to look for them at the time you do them. I think we should also be fair. I understand the question about uh, the technical capacities of uh, members of parliament. The fact that is that no parliament anywhere in the world has members of parliament who are experts in delimitation and so forth, although politicians they understand the impact, the outcome. Once it's done and you have shifted people, you have done gerrymandering or um, you have um, uh, uh, mal apportioned uh, uh, the voters from one area to the other and so forth, politicians and members of communities can feel that. You don't have to be an expert to experience and understand the consequence of delimitation. But you have to be an expert to apply the formula and, uh, and do the technical work, and that's what is important. If you look at the report or analysis of the ad hoc committee, and indeed the final report that uh, also consolidated the views of members of parliament, it's technical. Parliament had a technical team supporting them to produce the report that they did. The report was very technical, very well informed, and that is how Parliament uh, proceeds on such matters. It too gets its, its own uh, experts. Otherwise, the rest of the community were reacting to the consequences or the outcome of what the experts had done. Thank you. All right, Professor Maduku. Oh, sorry, thank you, Paul, for that question. I can actually tell you that um, from a political point, uh, speaking for myself and uh, my party, the NCA, we have started the report. If we were to be um, very clear, we would prefer that um, the next elections be held under a new delimitation uh, set report a new de delimitation of wards. In other words, we would not support a position of election being held under the existing uh, electoral boundary. But that doesn't mean that uh, we would then say we embrace the report as it is. If we were to have our way, we would prefer a situation where uh, the report clearly, I mean, Zek has is given time or enough opportunity to attend to the concerns that uh, were raised. Uh, we also raised the, uh, some of the concerns uh, in the platform that we are in, in Poland. We would prefer that. I know that some people say that um, then that means postponement of election. You, are, you raised your question late, but uh, there is still room to find time so that we don't have this argument, which is now affecting everyone. Here yeah, I'm speaking politically, again, to remind you, which is affecting everyone, which is just to do with the timing of the election. And if you have to do with the timing of the election, you end up with a situation where Zek is hurried to then be unable to come up with a proper report that addresses all the concerns. And on the other hand, those that might want an election under the existing boundaries 
who get their way. Remember that if the ZEC report is uh, gazetted outside the time limit, that report will still then be the basis of an election in 2028 and an election uh, another five years from that, which is not. We need a very good and proper uh, report. I don't want to introduce a new thing. Uh, you can always delay an election by a month or two months and so forth under the existing arrangement so that you really get a proper report coming out of, of the whole thing. That would be the position uh, from a political point. Uh, thank you, Professor Maduku. I uh, I keep try add, trying to add uh, Mr. Mugwadi, and um, he keeps falling off. I hope that um, he can come back on uh, as we sum up. But we will now start our summing up, summings up uh, with uh, uh, Honorable Sibanda. Please go ahead, and then uh, Professor Moyo, then Professor Maduku. And if we do have uh, Mr. Mugwadi connect, I might um, uh, ask you to indulge me to interrupt that uh, uh, sequence and bring him on immediately so that at least he can have a word in before we close this space. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Sibanda, please, please proceed. Yeah, Chofamba, thank you so much. Uh, uh, I have taken time to listen to our good professors and uh, a number of questions that were flying around. I think as I wrap up, uh, basically, what I want to say is that uh, the Constitution is very clear on what has to be done. And uh, we cannot, as of now, speculate on whether the recommendations that were recommendations, comments, and observations that uh, were put across by Parliament and were put across by the President were adequately and sufficiently attended to by ZEC or not, because we are not yet in possession of uh, uh, ZEC's uh, report after its considerations. But I think what we are fixated with is a, a scenario where we say, in terms of the law, once uh, ZEC and uh, the pre once once parliament and uh, and the president have made their recommendations and observations to zek and zek have come out and said we have attended to those concerns and observations that you made i i think the issue of whether to criticize or not to criticize what zek would then have come up with after taking into consideration those recommendations is something for posterity. For now, our fixation is that we need to go to the elections. I mean, there's no room for us to postpone. There's no room for us to go back to 2007, 2008 delimitation positions. I think from the beginning, we made it very clear that this report was not good, but this report was not bad. At least it is a near reflection of the distribution of registered voters in the, in the, in the country, regardless of its weaknesses. There are a number of weaknesses that it has, but we need to move forward. We cannot draw backward. We need to move forward. And the forward is to make sure that we make sure that all the steps that are required in terms of the law are followed and we get to the conclusion that is expected of by the law. I thank you. Oh, thank you. Mr. Mgadi, immediately jump in. Oh, thank you very much, uh, our host, and my greetings to uh, the two professors on the speaker's panel, Professor Jonathan Moyo and Professor Love Momai took my lecture as well. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for a very incisive discussion. But um, all that I just want to say, having had the privilege, of course, to be much more of the listener than uh, uh, talking, is that our position as a, as a political organization, as NPF, uh, you know, is that uh, uh, we have taken a view, a collective view, that this is a constitutional process. 
and there's a constitutional process it is uh, taking place according to section 161 of the the constitution of zimbabwe and bearing in mind that uh, the zimbabwe electoral commission uh, zec is a chapter 12 institution on its own a very sensitive one whose uh, independence and integrity uh, must also be seen to be uh, protected we have taken a position that uh, we follow this pro this process and have measured commendation open our views respectively to ensure that uh, we don't uh, interfere or intimidate the process you may also need to understand that uh, the president of the republic is a key player in this process uh, being the the midwife between parliament uh, zec and the people's views as expressed through parliament in terms of uh, uh, the draft preliminary report and the way it is now so as a party we have taken a position like i said earlier that we will respect this process as a constitutional process and we are we're actually much more happy to see uh, the confusion coming about uh, you know uh, views various views coming from all political parties some pockets of individuals or groups from across the the the, the political establishments for us it clearly attests to the integrity and the independence of uh, the referee in this matter the delimitation authority which is uh, which is zec it also dispels all manner of rumors and uh, fears that uh, the zimbabwe electoral commission is biased towards a certain political organization if it were that biased then of course we could have seen polarized views coming out with probably say the ruling part completely against it while the opposition support it or vice versa the opposition completely against it and the ruling part uh, supporting it but uh, a clear analysis of the views coming across board clearly attested to uh, the independence and the integrity of this uh, important electoral authority and as a ruling part we are we are home and dry with that but be that as it may we'll always uh, have measured views to the process and respect the work that uh, uh, the constitutional <clears throat> board zec is i mean is carrying out and also the views of parliament to the report the views of the president the views of the public we respect those out at the end of the day what is clear is that in 2023 we'll have general harmonized elections and those are imminent whether uh, we are going to those elections under the infrastructure of the current existing boundaries or the boundaries that have come out of this process that's a question for another day which is a ruling part again we would not want to poke our nose into we leave all that to uh, the constitutional organs of the state to pursue that process to their fullest conclusion ultimately our role is therefore limited and our views are limited but it was very interesting to hear the views from colleagues uh, the two professors uh, quite very incisive views i think that's all i can say at the moment ultimately zimbabweans will be encouraged to understand that uh, the delimitation process is not carried out to satisfy the interests or whims of political organizations or political players as it were it is a national process a national process that is carried out not for purposes of political organizations and their interests as it were but even for the non-voting population of our country the limitation uh, process must benefit them whether they vote or they don't vote that's a question for another day but this is a national process for purposes of allocating parliamentary representation local government uh, or local authorities as it were representation and that process is a national process it is not a political process i mean it is not a political party
process rather. That's all I would otherwise say. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mgwad. It's, uh, it's been uh, very uh, important to have uh, your voice uh, included in this uh, conversation. Uh, perhaps maybe before we go off to uh, sum, off, uh, sum, sum up with our two professors uh, remaining to do so, I may pose this question on behalf of uh, the audience who um, maybe this has been raised before you joined. The issue of uh, the conflicting statements between the spokespersons of government and you being the ruling party um, this is ZANU-PF in government, and uh, state functionaries within the executive have given conflicting statements about the status of the report submitted to the president. Was it a final report? Was it not a final report? What is um, ZANU-PF's categorical position on that? Again, uh, that's a technical question, but all that I can say is that, uh, as you are aware, I'm not a spokesperson of the government of Zimbabwe. Uh, the spokesperson of uh, the government of Zimbabwe. I'm sure uh, the Minister of Information and Publicity, Comrade Monica Mchangwa, or uh, maybe the Permanent Secretary there, and also Comrade George Charamba being the mouthpiece of the Head of State and Government and President of the Republic. So, and uh, reading the Sunday Mail, and uh, you, you know what we are alleging to be confusion. I saw this presidential spokesperson clarifying uh, what that means and what they mean by saying that uh, this was not essentially a final report. But anyway, I don't want to get into those uh, intricate details because as you are aware, like I said, we have taken a backbench as a part to allow the state, state authorities, government, to proceed with this process and the rightful organs to give direction to this process without necessarily having to take instructions from the party because the party takes a view that the constitutional process must be led to be one and it must proceed unabated without intimidation real or imagined no thank you that's uh, that's uh, fair enough um i will now move on to uh, professor moyo and then uh, professor maduku to sum up uh, before we uh, call it an evening uh, thank you uh, moderator uh, I would like to end by thanking you uh, for doing a sterling job uh, as a moderator. I didn't know that uh, you have this patience. Uh, one wouldn't know, uh, judging by <laughs> the fiery stuff you post on your Twitter and, and so forth. But you, you are amazingly calm and uh, very accommodating. No, I you. appreciate it. I also would like to once again, thank uh, Zim Life for creating this, this platform. As I said at the beginning, it would have been wonderful to have it earlier uh, and uh, feed into the debate that was happening, especially in Parliament. I also thank the participants. This is maybe uh, because of you, uh, moderator, your style, and, 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 and maybe the platform Zim Life. I, I, I from from my experience, this is uh, the the best platform I've had from uh, on a Twitter space discussing a serious issue and being serious right from the beginning to the end. I I really uh, pray that uh, you set a standard and uh, that this becomes more the norm because uh, we can learn quite a lot from each other if we engage in this, in this kind of way. I think uh, Professor Matuku uh, for, for his engagement. Uh, it was a, a pleasure to share this uh, platform uh, with him. And uh, I also thank uh, Honorable Sibanda, um, a, a fellow Matt Northern, uh, for his uh, participation and sharing with us uh, his views. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Smanda was a, a member of the ad hoc committee uh, from Parliament. The fact that we survived this discussion without him calling us out of order in terms of attributing things to that committee uh, means we, we tried uh, our best. Uh, it was really great to see some of our colleagues here. Great to see Hope for 
uh, uh, and to engage with him, uh, Violet, uh, Advocate uh, Tavani Mpofu, and Sgarade uh, um, from Cholocho and so forth, many uh, colleagues. Uh, it's always a pleasure uh, uh, from the dungeon to see these people here. Um, I think that um, uh, really uh, we were constrained by the fact that uh, uh, while there are certain views, uh, the, 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 what is before us is that the, re the final report or the content of the final report uh, has not been exposed to us. We have not seen it. And um, I, I have a strong feeling going by what... Uh, the chairperson of uh, ZEC, uh, Justice Chigumba, said uh, on the day she presented the final report, as we've described it. Um, I have a feeling that most of the critical issues, the sensitive issues which were raised by Parliament uh, in particular, uh, will, 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 will find some expression of one sort or another. I'm confident, at least I hope that... The, uh, 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 this will be the case. And in relation to that, as my concluding uh, remark, uh, 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 moderator, uh, we have to note with a, a lot of concern that uh, uh, while the political, some of the political parties, not all, uh, have been sort of active, certainly uh, in the parliamentary process, civic society has been conspicuous by its absence in this debate. Uh, there's something going on in our civil society which is unhelpful. Uh, even some of the uh, electoral-based civic organizations, including the likes of ZESNI, they were silent at the most critical time. They were not available to help society understand either what's being said in parliament or what's being said uh, uh, by ZEC, ZEC or what is in fact uh, or was in the draft uh, preliminary delimitation report. This is unlike in other societies. Even the media was unhelpful. Uh, you, it was not possible to understand what is in that report what is it that the members of parliament are taking issue and so forth and what are the questions uh i i i, I with that or this kind of civil society we we have to be concerned some of them uh, then made their submissions a day or two after parliament had uh, presented uh, its analysis uh, uh, to the president and 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 and, and uh, the horses had bolted I think there is a need for some serious introspection and critical analysis of the state of civil society in Zimbabwe. Uh, it can do much better, and similarly, the media can do much better. Sometimes it's impossible, I mean, it's necessary rather for these mediating organizations to present issues the way they are reduce them to a level that uh, the citizens can understand so that they can debate in a meaningful way. I don't say this uh, with any axe to grind against anyone. I just think it, the issue was too conspicuous uh, and, and therefore difficult to, to avoid. With that, once again, I thank you for the opportunity, uh, mod moderator. Thank you, Professor. Um, now we will conclude with uh, Professor Maduko's remarks. Uh, like Professor Moyo, I would really want to thank you. Um, yourself, Moda. Uh, uh, hello? Yes, I can hear you. Please proceed. Okay, that's fine. I think just like Professor Moy, I'd like to thank you, moderator, for um, an excellent uh, process of moderating the discussion. And then, of course, the um, host, uh, Zim Life. Uh, but I want to particularly thank Professor Moyo for the, uh, I think, the manner in which we conducted the debate. We are trying to show the way, uh, which is to ensure that uh, you approach serious issues in a serious manner, you look at the issues as they are, 
that's what I really got from the whole exercise. So I should thank him very much for creating a framework like that. And then I think to the rest of uh, Zimbabweans, uh, we must continue to utilize these frameworks. Um, they appear to provide us with enough scope to exchange views. And if anything, I would like to call upon the media in particular to ensure that these issues continue to be at the forefront of a public debate and the forefront of a public focus. Otherwise, uh, I think it has been a well done exercise. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Maduku. Uh, thank you to all our uh, speakers. And uh, thank you to Mr. Mgwadi. Uh, you managed to come in uh, in the end. So we heard from uh, uh, the ruling party as well. Um, thank you to everybody who's attended this space and to Zim Live for hosting it. Indeed, um, the media do have an important role to play, especially as we get into this season uh, towards the elections. Uh, the media's role is to educate and inform. And there are many critical issues uh, uh, in the national interest that we need to unpack and when we can uh, create spaces where we can uh, meet and discuss these issues dispassionately uh, and, and uh, uh, create insight and understanding, we are all the better you know, as a nation. So we are moving forward, uh, 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 at least with understanding of the processes that uh, we have to engage with and how we can improve those. We hope that um, going forward, there will be more topics that we will uh, host uh, and um, invite you to come and uh, participate. Uh, different uh, participants from all walks of uh, life, uh, uh, we hope, will join these platforms and be part of this uh, conversation so that we get a national conversation going. And that becomes a, a, a culture, uh, our culture online, to engage on uh, with these serious issues uh, in a cordial uh, manner where we seek to uh, 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 enlighten one another and uh, to move forward more uh, positively as a nation so to everybody who's attended this space look out for the next one um dudu z and uh, the team at zim life uh will be uh, uh sharing information on what topics uh will be coming next but um it's been uh, great to host this space which uh curiously enough is my first space uh to host um very um, comfortable behind the words which is the name of a column that professor moyo founded at uh, the mirror which I went on to edit, and I later uh, wrote uh, that column. And um, that's my comfort zone behind the words. But um, I'm having to <laughs> come up front onto the microphone and uh, be able to host these uh, uh, discussions. And more of this will be coming. So uh, look out for that. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good evening.